AI is taking the world by storm. And in today's video, we are going to talk about five different ways that AI is being used in wildlife biology. We're going to talk about how AI is used in soundscapes, habitat monitoring, predicting species distributions, monitoring camera traps, and even for anti-poaching methods. You can find chapter markers down below so you can jump around where you want to. And if you like what you see today, make sure to subscribe, like the video, leave a comment, do all those things that YouTubers tell you to do. But let's hop right into it. And the first one is going to be for analyzing soundscapes. I am on the Wildlife Acoustics websites. The links for everything I show you today will be down in the description. And Wildlife Acoustics creates uh, acoustic monitors for wildlife. Uh, so they have these uh, devices that you can set out into the field right here. Uh, they are typically used for uh, bats. That's where I see it most often used. There's even one that can plug directly into your phone. Um, but you can use it for frogs, which is what I've used it for, as well as birds and other large animals, uh, essentially any animal that makes a call. But it's their software, Kaleidoscope. Uh, this is an analysis software that allows you to say, hey, uh, here are 35 different audio recorders, and it provides a sonogram, and it allows you to manually say, this is this species. Um, for example, uh, where is this picture? Here we go. This is a picture from a publication. Um, I'm not actually sure if they used Kaleidoscope, but it shows the concept very well. Uh, these are two different species of frogs, Hyla uh, chrysocellus and Hyla versicolor. Uh, as you can see, their calls are shown here. And there are slight differences. You see that the Hyla uh, chrysocellus, which is on the left-hand side, the call is at a higher frequency. There are more bars, um, or I guess it's at a higher rate is more accurate. Um, there are more bars within the same time span. Uh, so this is one way that we're able to identify species based on their calls. If we looked at these two and I saw that there were, you know, 20 to 30 bars within this half second time frame versus roughly 10, I could identify the species together. But Kaleidoscope actually has machine learning, which is a form of AI that allows you to auto detect the calls of many different species. And so the way this works, if we, if we hop over into uh, the whiteboard app, say we have a call and we first take in, uh, let's say we have 100 calls, right? We have 100 different audio files that have calls within them. And each of them show up with these little bars, the little soundscape analysis. Let's say I take the first 20 or 30 of those files and I identify every single call manually. So I'm going to say, take this one. I know this is a, uh, let's just say this is a green tree frog. Uh, we're gonna use common names from here on out. Um, I can then keep doing this and then maybe there's another call. Uh, the next file, I find it's a green tree frog. Um, and then maybe it even has multiple calls. So we have this one, uh, it's another green tree frog. So I'm just gonna call it GTF. Um, and then there's another call over here that is maybe more of a increasing in frequency pitch. Uh, let's just say this is a, let's just say it's a, gr no. Uh, let's say it's a uh, completely different species. Uh, let's say this is a Gulf Coast toad. Uh, this is not accurate to their calls. Um, and yeah, so we can identify them for the software, okay? After you do this enough times, this is called creating a training data set for the machine learning software. You can then let it auto run over your remaining clips and have it detect the calls. Now, you do wanna do manual validation. You can download calls from the internet and use that in your training data set, but uh, sometimes there are minor differences between areas. So the machine learning software is usually a little bit of a black box. It detects um, different features that we are really unable to detect consciously uh, without an insane amount of work, um, and it does it much, much faster. I actually know that what they did is, one year I did it, and it took me maybe two months or so to fully go through the data set, you know, not working full time. I was a student, student worker uh, in undergrad. And, but I manually went through all of our files and uh, manually validated every single one. And then the next year when they re-ran the study, um, I had moved on to other things, 
they used my manual validation as the training data set. So it took my months and months and months of effort and was able to do it in just a couple days. So this is dramatically increasing the uh, efficacy and the speed of monitoring species uh, according to their audio calls. And this is very, very easy. There is an upfront cost to buy all the recorders, to get licenses for the software, but you can imagine that you spend the time, you spend uh, an insane amount of time manually validating uh, the, the calls in a specific area for as many species as you can, and then maybe the next year, you set out 20 different recorders, okay? You set out a recorders in four different habitats. Maybe over here uh, is, uh, let's just call this the grassland, and over here is the swamp, and over here is the forest, right? And you set out maybe five uh, audio recorders in each of these areas, making sure that they're uh, far enough a distance away from each of the other ones so you're not getting overlapping uh, calls. Um, but then 15 audio recorders, um, having to monitor all of those, change out the batteries, uh, get the data, and then actually analyze the data, that is going to be an insane amount of cost and time. But with AI tools, you could run the data set uh, through this software and dramatically increase the data output. You could very, very quickly analyze all of this data. And yes, you still need to do manual validation. It is still very wise to double check, at least pop up all of the ones that were tagged as, um, as having a call and double checking that it's correct. AI, machine learning, it's not a perfect tool, but it dramatically saves you time. And I thought I wanted to start with Soundscapes because it's one that I've actually done before and actually did uh, when I was an undergraduate. It was one of my first real research projects and I got paid to do it, so that was cool. Um, but yeah, analyzing Soundscapes, that is one amazing way that AI is being used in wildlife biology. The second way that AI is being used in wildlife biology is to predict species distributions or more accurately to predict areas where species could occur. And I'm showing you probably the most famous one, which is a max ent, maximum entropy. This is probably the most widely used um, method. Uh, it's also probably one of the easiest methods. And it's quite simple. So what you do, uh, it's also now open source, which I'm very much uh, a big, 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 big fan of. But the way that these software work, and there's, there's many different methods. There are many different methods, but almost all of them follow the same type of protocol. And you're going to see that this is a, a common trend of training data and then predicted data. So training data, predicted data. So this is uh, quite simple. So maybe the most uh, straightforward way of running Maxent, maybe the way that is most often used whenever you are following a tutorial, trying to figure it out yourself, is to provide some training data set and species occurrences. So what you can provide is a raster file uh, that says, hey, within every single one of these uh, grid cells, okay, so this is a, a raster is basically a collection of grid cells, um, in case you didn't know. So within each of these cells, we can have various types of data, such as temperature. So maybe average temperature over the course of a year. We could have rainfall. We can have elevation. We can have the humidity, et cetera, et cetera. There are many, many different uh, data sets that we can input into these cells. But this is also paired with the species occurrences. So let's say we take the same size grid cell, maybe these are uh, 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers, okay? We have within each of those grid cells, the temperature, the rainfall, the elevation, the humidity. And then we also have do species occur there? So let's say we're looking at, um, we're gonna use, we're gonna, now frogs are not gonna work for all of this. Um, let's use a different example. Let's say we're looking at uh, uh, the blue jays. We wanna know uh, where are blue jays, okay? We wanna know uh, how do we find blue jays? Uh, where are these uh, blue jays found? 
and this is maybe not a good example because most often you're going to use this for species that are uh, not well sampled throughout the range where we really don't know where they may be. Um, that, that's one particular use case. So uh, a lot of reptiles and amphibians, we simply don't really know their full range. Um, so this is a great method for kind of figuring out. And then what it will do is it'll go through each of these grid cells and give you a presence matrix. Basically saying, one, we have detected the species there or zero, we have not detected the species there. And then you'll, the, you'll just keep running this and then you'll have a range. This is the current known range of, in this case, the Blue Jays. But then don't forget, you have all of this extra data, temperature, rainfall, elevation, humidity. What it can find is that, hey, maybe these, these grid cells that have blue jays that we know where blue jays are well it seems like they're typically in areas with a high temperature high temp and low rainfall i don't know if this is actually true for the blue jays i'm just giving you an example here so maybe you find that maybe you find that you know what elevation doesn't really seem to matter they are birds they fly up to the mountains that that's not real birds do have elevation constraints but Still, what it can find is, hey, some variables are actually very, very tightly uh, correlated to the presence or absence of a particular species. So once you train your data set with this information, it can then go out and predict like, well, hey, we know it's not, we, we only know the blue is going to be the, the known range of the species. But then it'll say, hey, we also think that the blue jays could be here. Um, and in fact, some of these areas where you said that you've never found them before, eh, we, we think they could be there. We think they could actually be there, okay? So this is what MaxInt does as well as many other species distribution models. And there are so many different types that allow you to input so much different data. But what is fascinating with this and an extra component that is widely used is that you can actually predict species ranges over time so this right here these these temperature rainfall elevation humidity this is in the current time this is right now 2023 what is the average temperature rainfall elevation humidity over maybe the last 10 years let's say we're going to be take a decade's worth of data to get a good mean of this well let's say so let's say that this is uh let's say this is 2010 to 2020 okay so a decade well what would the temperature be in 2040 through 2050? We have predictions for that. Um, let me move myself out of the way. We, we have predictions for what these values are going to be at, right? We can predict that temperature is going to increase in those years. We can predict that maybe rainfall uh, in a specific area, let's say that this is deserts, are going to decrease. Uh, elevation is of course going to stay the same. With a decrease in rainfall, we assume a decrease in humidity. Well, we can use that trained data set from their current known distributions to then predict where the species would be in 2040 or 2050. And this is through AI. This is through machine learning. This is by providing a training data set and then using it to predict. And I, I want to let you know that this sounds really, really complicated. I can promise you it is actually not that bad. In fact, here is an R function that you use um, <laughs> uh, in the package Dismo for species distribution modeling. And the maxint function is just uh, maxint and you just provide it with a predictors, the raster object. So you could have a, uh, you can have a raster stack is what it's called. And it has maybe, uh, you know, 10 different layers uh, where one layer is temperature, one layer is humidity, one layer is elevation, just like we talked about. And then you have P, which is your occurrence data, just um, where are the species being found. Very, very easy to actually run some of these. Now to run them correctly is the challenge. It's very easy to just to, to throw in all of this data and say, hey, tell me where the Blue Jays are going to be. Uh, but it's, it's, it takes a while to actually make sure you're doing it correctly. And there's a lot of nuance. But I will say you can very, very easily learn how to run a Maxent in under a day. I'm not even kidding. It is so easy. Um, just follow a really good tutorial and you could be predicting species distribution models uh, very, very quickly.
the third way that AI is being used is for processing camera trap data. If you have ever run a camera trap yourself, you already understand the intimate problem of you go out, you set out camera traps to detect wildlife like this American badger here, or this uh, maroon leaf monkey, or maybe just deer and boar and whatever else is around you. And what happens is you get a leaf in front of your camera, it triggers it a million times, you go to check it, you have 3,000 photos of a leaf, and you need to figure out the five photos within it uh, that actually have wildlife inside of it. And I wanna focus here on eMammal, which is an online tool that allows you to upload your camera trap data, uh, validate it, and then it actually gets automatically archived with the Smithsonian. And the reason I'm focusing with them is because Microsoft um, has partnered with them to actually have AI help process that camera trap data. Um, essentially, eMammal uses machine learning to categorize its massive library and guide contributors to accurate results. More or less, you can actually look at the pictures and say, hey, there is an animal here, there is an animal in here, and it can hopefully be used to say, this is a large mammal, or maybe this is a bird, or this is a uh, some type of monkey. Um, maybe it can't get down to the species level, but even if it can just detect, there is something inside of this picture that you need to look at that is tremendously helpful for analyzing this data. R remember, a big part of this, if we're talking about the soundscapes, which is very similar to this, the soundscapes are um, very expensive to analyze. It is very, very expensive, both time and money, to go through this data. And also, it's really demotivating because the vast majority of the time, it's nothing. There are a lot of false positives with camera trap data. And also, if you think about it in another way, we often have to run our camera traps via infrared sensors. We often need to do it to where something triggers the trap and then it takes the picture. But this does not work for all species. This doesn't work for very small taxa. This is very difficult to do with reptiles and amphibians, which are often the same temperature as their surrounding environment. There, there are ways around that that I really want to do. But um, imagine then, instead of having it take the picture every time it triggers, or hopefully if it triggers, you could then take the picture every five seconds. Take an enormous amount of data which you can also use for other projects, but then AI can actually tell you, hey, there was something in this picture. There was actually something here. That is going to be the beauty of it. Um, and with, with eMammal specifically, basically people can upload the image. So they have a little graphic here. Uh, let me zoom in. Um, it's actually not zooming in pretty well. Oh, hey, look. Um, but yeah, you take the image, you upload the images, it goes up into the cloud, machine learning is then able to identify which images contain animals, and then you have insights. And of course, you can plug this in um, over time to analyze other covariates, such as, hey, we found, we detected um, a whole bunch of large mammals, and it seems like they always peak at around six in the morning. They're always coming out then. Um, we also detected with weather data that it seems like they really like cloudy days, um, or the moon cycle is massively affecting them. So by actually utilizing AI for camera trap data, not only does it cut down on the time that it takes to analyze that data, but it allows us to do more complex projects. Um, this is sort of a good note point that th there was a fear of that AI is going to replace field techs, right? Um, you don't have to pay three people to go through all of your camera trap data and analyze it and, you know, sit there for eight hours a day clicking the, the right button on the keyboard looking at the next picture. Um, I, I highly disagree. What this is going to do is it's going to enable better projects. Those same field techs that are doing a completely unrewarding and thankless job of going through the camera trap data could instead manage three times as many camera traps. Instead of having to manage five or six, they could manage 15 or 20 and let the AI do the analysis for them while they do the hard work of actually maintaining the camera traps. Because AI is not going to go out and replace the batteries. AI is not going to set them up in different habitats. AI is not going to collect the SD cards. This is going to fundamentally change and is fundamentally changing what projects we can do with 
limited resources. So it's not replacing field text, it's enabling better junk. The fourth way that AI is being used is for monitoring ecosystem health through remote sensing. And I might be jumping the gun a little bit. Uh, in, uh, the journal Remote Sensing is actually going to have a special issue on advanced artificial intelligence for environmental remote sensing. Um, and, and essentially what this is, so remote sensing is sensing something remotely. And the way this operates um, in, in a lot of cases nowadays, uh, I'll, I'll give you a few different, eh, we'll, we'll focus on one. So let's say that we have, uh, we have satellites up in the sky, okay? Uh, and these satellites are able to take, well, satellite imagery of the Earth. So uh, this is the Earth right down here. And let's see, do, 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 do. it's taking satellite imagery of the Earth. And this is one way you can also do it with, uh, with drones uh, flying overhead. So say that you're managing a uh, natural resource area in Africa and you're having it fly over, the, the, the drone is flying over the habitat on a, let's say once a month it flies over and it's taking the same data. It's uh, taking images, it's taking different sensors that can detect different things. Uh, one of these sensors uh, could be for a metric called NDVI, which is being used um, pretty often. I want I want the color green. I don't want blue. What is going on here? There we go. Uh, so NDVI, and this is actually a, a pretty often used metric. And the, the 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 theory behind it is that um, it can detect plant cover. It can detect vegetation cover. So let's say we have um, some. I'm just gonna. I have the color red already prepped. So let's say this is a very clay-filled earth, and then you have the green vegetation cover. Um, what we know is that, well, hey, plants reflect different wavelengths of light. They reflect the green light, okay, while uh, red areas reflect red light. That's that's uh, how colors work. Um, we see things that are reflected. Well, metrics um, have actually been developed to detect the vegetation types based on the amount of reflectance, the amount of green reflectance or other color reflectance in general. Um, there are various different ways of doing it. I'm trying not to get too deep in the, in the weeds. But it's actually getting to a point where we can detect forests from grasslands, bare earth from uh, shrubland, and all of that is being utilized with AI. So machine learning, again, it can actually detect these changes over time. So you can detect changes in vegetation cover. Um, this is just one way of doing it. You can also detect changes in water quality based on that reflectance. So is the water reflecting blue or is it reflecting brown? Um, just as a very baseline example. And it can utilize all of these different uh, variables, all this different information to detect and monitor environmental health over time. Maybe you're in an area, you know, if you have hundreds of thousands of acres, maybe even millions of acres in some cases, um, where you're trying to monitor this whole land and you have a team of 30, Jesus Christ, how are you going to do that? Well, you could send out the drone. Okay, uh, the drones are more reasonable for a, for a small scale project. For large scale projects, you're probably going to be using satellites more. But if you're managing an area, you're probably going to be using drones. And say you send them out every week and you are just having all these sensors that can detect all these different changes. And you find that, oh wait, hey, for some reason, this uh, main stream over here that connects to a really important watering hole, for some reason, it is not looking good. You know, and maybe your home base is way over here, um, maybe an hour's drive away, and you can't monitor it closely. But your drone can fly over the landscape, it can get there very quickly. So this is able to not only monitor environmental uh, health or, or ecosystem health in more or less real time, it's going to, again, fundamentally make everything easier, make everything cheaper, make everything faster so that we can better monitor a particular environment, a particular ecosystem. And again, AI, machine learning, this is being utilized with this to monitor it quickly. So we're not collecting the data for three months, then spending three months in analysis hell, trying to understand it better, and then realizing three months later after we've already done it that, ah, shit, this area went really, really bad, and, and we just found out nine months ago, uh, nine months now. So machine learning is just making things a lot faster because you've already trained the data set, you've already trained the, uh, the AI model to 
help you understand your area. And this is actually a really good transition to the last way that AI is being used for wildlife biology, and that is to actually stop poaching. Okay, and this is probably the coolest thing. So let's say we, we send out the drone, right? Our drone is already going out. It already has sensors to detect these uh, different vegetation habitats. It's taking pictures of the landscape, blah, 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 blah. There are already tools being developed, such as this one, PAWS, Protected Assistant for Wildlife Security, that is able to actually, <laughs> this is crazy. It can learn a model of poachers behavior produce poaching risk maps and suggest patrol routes for rangers they have been used to detect and remove a thousand snares from the from a uh from a u a, a, a uav a drone going over the landscape and detect where snares are where traps are where poachers are are. And this is, I mean, absolutely incredible. There is another one. Um, uh, boo, 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 where is this one? Yes. So here, here I can actually detect it. Um, this, look at this video right here. So it's actually detecting people. Of course, this has been developed in military uses for a long time. Um, but it's actually able to detect people. And if you're on a private reserve, if you're trying to protect the area, you send out the drone and it says, hey, there are people in the middle of our drone going towards our elephants, our rhinos, our giraffes and they're not supposed to be there, they can detect them in real time versus having, you know, 20 guys on a, uh, on a few Jeeps driving around trying to figure it out um, or uh, flying over on a helicopter, which is expensive. These are unmanned drones that can do it. Um, as well as detect, um, oh gosh, I thought I had it here, but it, it can actually detect where animals are. So it could follow a herd of elephants, right? And say, oh, we believe based on AI models, that they are going in this route. We know that every single week on Monday, they are going to this watering hole, which is something that, you know, humans can figure out. We, we can figure that out if we take detailed notes, but the AI can do it just faster and usually with better predictions. So um, I am beyond excited for what AI can actually utilize for this, uh, particularly for anti-poaching methods. The ability to predict poaching behavior is absolutely mind-blowing to me. Uh, so yeah, they can automatically detect poachers and animals via thermal infrared images, meaning they can also run them at nighttime. That's a huge portion of it. Um, it it's, and it's also not that difficult. They used it with a very slow internet connection, which is a big problem with being in remote areas where wildlife often is. Um, it is absolutely incredible what they can do so here's a uh so here's an example look at this so on the left hand side is the actual image from the drone on the right hand side is the thermal image you do not see the poachers on the left hand image you just do not see them um, and it's, it's not clear if these are actually poachers or if these are rangers that they're using to train the data set. Um, so again, the IR, the infrared, is able to tell these poachers in a much better way than we ever could. This is fundamentally changing the biology landscape. Um, and I just think it's really cool. I think that we, as a society, really need to embrace AI and realize that it's a useful tool that is going to change everything. It is not going to replace us. In fact, what is often being said is that you are going to be replaced by someone who knows how to use AI. Not that AI will replace you, it's that someone has a better tool. You can think of it in the same vein as like, oh, R Studio is replacing Excel, or R is replacing SPSS, or Excel is replacing pen and paper. Um, it's, it's, it's not that it's a replacing you, it's that there are better tools out there for the data, for the tasks that we want to accomplish, and people are learning it, and we need to learn it as well in order to stay up to date. But uh, these are just five uses. So again, uh, analyzing soundscapes, predicting species distributions, processing camera trap data, monitoring ecosystem health, and for anti-poaching methods. 
absolutely incredible. And uh, hey, if you like your set, if you watch till the end of this video, you're cool as hell. If you skipped around, don't worry, you're still cool as hell. But uh, hey, subscribe, like, comment, do all those things that YouTubers tell you to do. And uh, yeah, have a great day.